speaking about renewable energy on Malta. And I want to introduce you my guest. Okay, my name is Charles Youssef. I work at the university as a senior lecturer, but also I am the Secretary General of the Malta Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energies Association. It's a very long name, yes. so we summarize it as MIREA, M-E-E-R-E-A. -E -E yeah. And uh, of course, this association was not uh, established recently. It was established back in 2001 as part of a Euromed project uh, where the university and other partners from Europe were uh, discussing on energy policy. Uh, in 2001, energy policies was still at its infancy and there was very little information, very little education on that. And the idea of that Euromed project was to establish an energy agency in each and every uh, partner in that project. In that same year, uh, Malta had its first energy agency, government energy agency. So it didn't make sense to make two agencies. And uh, the project uh, thought that instead of an agency for Malta, it would be nice to have an NGO that works on sustainable energy and energy efficiency and renewable energy. And that is why in Malta we set up this asso association uh, in June 2001 with uh, about eight founding members, uh, most of them from uh, academia, but also we had a journalist who is uh, still very active, uh, Vanya Walker Lee. She's an international journalist and she, she is a, a promoter of uh, uh, activities uh, favoring uh, uh, things that have to do with climate change and so on. Yeah, so we, 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 that's how we started. Yes, and yes. Uh, what is the main goals of your organizations and what, uh, what is your actions now? Exactly, so uh, the main goals uh, remain uh, that of education. Uh, so we try to reach out to the general public and to people uh, who are uh, less aware about uh, energy efficiency and renewable energies. We had uh, in the past done a very uh, nationwide uh, program for all uh, teachers and school children uh, at year six. That means they will be children of about um, uh, eight years old, eight to nine years old. And funnily enough, uh, some of those students are now teachers themselves. And when they meet me in the street, they tell me, I remember still the program that you did back in 2004. And that was one of the very important programs that we received, uh, of course, funding from the European Union to, 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 uh, to make it. Um, but besides information and uh, awareness raising, we do a lot of lobbying, uh, also at EU level. One of the most important lobbying that we did uh, only two years ago was to partner with, with solar power. Solar power is also a uh, a European uh, uh, nationwide uh, NGO and we were uh, proposing to the EU to remove uh, the taxes that were imposed on solar panels uh, being imported into the EU uh, from uh, third countries like China, India and so on. Uh, and in fact today this tax has been removed and the solar PV panels as we know, most of them come from these countries, have now reduced the price and therefore there is a better chance of having more PV uh, panels in European countries. And uh, so that is the second uh, aim of the, of the association. We also uh, provide uh, a, a point of contact. So there will be like companies or promoters of energy efficiency products and they don't know where to go, so we help them to find the right partners in the market. And the last thing is about uh, also uh, supporting uh, government in Malta, for example, by giving feedback on uh, policies that appear uh, 
for public consultation. And, for, and in any case, our uh, aim is to promote energy efficiency and have more renewable energy in Malta. Three years ago, we also became the umbrella of the energy performance certification assessors. These assessors are engineers or architects who take a specialized course to be able to certify buildings. When we say certify buildings, it means you give a building a rating, class A, class B, class C, similar to fridges, freezers, and televisions. This is an EU directive that all buildings that are up for sale or for rent or are being built new or renovated, they must have this certificate. And the whole idea after, after all is that to create awareness raising in the European citizens and enable them by time to make a choice between an energy efficient building and a less energy efficient building. Mm -hmm. It is going to be a successful uh, campaign. Why? Because today we know that if I or you go to the market to buy a fridge, we don't look at the price first, but we look if that fridge is class A++ or yes. not. Yes. And the EU wants all European citizens to look at the energy efficiency of the building first. Yes because in the building industry, 40% of the energy consumed in Europe is actually consumed in buildings. So that's a substantial amount. And for you, heating, for cooling. For, yes, yes, heating, cooling, lighting, yes. water heating, and ventilation. These are the five uh, pillars of energy efficiency in buildings. Yes. We do not consider appliances, because appliances have different directives and after all, appliances are not all the same in different buildings. Offices is different from a house, yes. a house is different from a hospital. But in any case, in a building, if you just consider uh, heating and cooling, water heating, lighting and ventilation, you have already covered more than 80% of the energy consumption of this building. Yes. So if you really manage to control that, uh, then you are making your building very efficient and also two more things very comfortable in the sense that the temperature remains constant and, and comfortable throughout the year without the need for uh, overspending uh, yes. of energy in cooling and heating. And the third thing which the EU now is pressing also for 2030 is to have the internal conditions uh, healthy. Mm -hmm. By healthy, we mean that the level of carbon dioxide in the rooms should be below a certain threshold. So it's when we say energy efficiency in buildings, we are talking about many things at one, at one go. Yes. So these are the aims of the, of the organization. What about the um, about, um, situation with renewable energy in Malta? How big percent of energy is renewable? Yeah. The, the renewable energy in Malta it only started recently to become uh, uh, popular. So we talk about uh, the past six years as being the, the most uh, flourishing in terms of renewable energy. And not all renewable energy systems are popular in Malta. Malta is a small island, it is sunny, it is in the Mediterranean, and, therefore, and it is small. So we have limitations, limitations in area. We have high population density, so we, we cannot afford to, to keep large spaces dedicated to renewable energy. We have to put renewable energy and make it part of our life part of our buildings, part of our playing fields. Uh, yes. But we cannot afford to dedicate a football ground, for example, yes. to put solar panels. When we come to renewable energy in Malta, we know that there is, for example, solar water heating, solar photovoltaics, wind energy, energy yes. from waste, geothermal, energy yeah, from the ground, 
biomass, but not all of them are popular in Malta because it is a small island, it is highly densely populated, and we cannot afford to dedicate large spaces yeah. to renewable energy. I'll give you an example. Many studies have happened for wind energy. Yeah. And it was seen that, first of all, not all the sites on the island are sufficiently windy to make wind energy um, and economically feasible. So, this few sites that were found to be uh, in terms of wind energy attractive, they had other conflicts. Um, for example, either the site is very close to the airport and therefore it, it, it does not allow, for safety reasons, it cannot be placed in the path of the air, aeroplanes yeah. approaching the airport. In other areas, there was an issue of uh, aesthetics because it was in a very prestigious place, very beautiful natural site, and if you put wind turbines, uh, then it will spoil the site. Yeah. Uh, it is also, there was another space where it will be in the line of migrating birds. In Malta, birds come from Africa, pass to Europe yeah. in winter and summer, and they pass over Malta. So if you put wind turbines, there was a big fear that uh, certain birds will be affected. Yeah. And the, when the, we went offshore to find places in the sea, again, there were, there were many conflicts. There was conflict with the raider of the army that controls uh, certain illegal activities in the sea. There was a, a problem with diving sites. Mm -hmm. Malta is a popular touristic site and there are certain areas, shallow areas in the sea, which are very popular for diving. Yeah. And if you put wind turbines there, the divers cannot use it. Other shallow areas are used for ship bunkering. So if there are ships passing from uh, across Malta and they need water, they need supplies, they stop in Malta in one of these reefs yes. and they get supplies from Malta. Now, if you go, go to put wind turbines there, you are spoiling like the business. Yeah. And of course, uh, uh, these issues showed that the only way how wind turbines can be used is if we have floating wind turbines, which means you put wind turbines in deep waters. Mm -hmm. However, the technology is not yet there. It's still very expensive yeah. to make. So what is popular in Malta? The first is photovoltaics, solar photovoltaics. So number one. Yes. Number one. We have over 120 megawatts already installed. When it comes to costs, like how much did it cost for all these PV panels to be installed? Here we are talking about 250 million euros. So it's quite substantial. It's the same investment like uh, part of a power station. Yes. So in these past six years, there has been a very strong drive towards solar photovoltaics. A government does it or private people do? Yes, there are grants, there are subsidies from government that support and encourage people to install PV systems on their rooftops. Yes. But also there are other uh, schemes through uh, the Malta Enterprise to encourage businesses yes. to take such projects. And more recently, there, are, there were schemes to encourage the installation of large uh, PV farms. That means you will have more than one megawatt in one particular area. But so far, these large PV farms are on uh, large rooftops. For example, on water reservoir rooftops or on the large rooftops of, um, of big companies yeah. or industrial estates. And uh, so, um, yeah, there are schemes. Yes. And this helped for photovoltaic prices to fall down. And uh, the feed-in tariff, that means the electricity produced can be sold to the grid at preferential rates, at very good rates, uh, more than 
the price of uh, electricity. Yes. And therefore, how it big energy. percent of renewable energy on Malta? How big? How big yeah. yes. um, in percentage wise, yes. we are now at the level of seven percent renewable energy. And the aim of the EU for Malta, the, 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 the target for 2020, by the end of 2020, to be 10%. Okay. Now, if Malta cannot achieve 10%, according to the EU directives, there are other three ways how you can achieve the difference. Yeah. One of them is to partner with another country, with another member state, and make projects in their own country. Okay. That electricity even though it will not be used in Malta, but because Malta is now connected to the European Union through an underwater cable yes. that passes from Malta to Sicily, we are considered as part of the electricity network of Europe. Yes. And therefore, essentially, you can invest in renewable energy anywhere in Europe, and that project will be counted towards your country. Yes. And you can achieve the percentage required. Another way of achieving the percentage needed up to 10% is by uh, investing in third countries, for example, in North Africa. Yeah. But in that case, the electricity produced must be fed into the European network. Mm -hmm. So far, the only cable that we have is between uh, uh, Spain and, uh, and, uh, and Algeria or Morocco. So, that cable is overloaded and it's a bit difficult to think of larger projects in North Africa feeding electricity yes. into the European Union. Uh, the fourth option is that Malta, if it cannot reach 10% renewable energy with its own local resources and installations, they can buy extra renewable energy from other member states who have exceeded their target. And this is controlled by means of uh, the electricity market regulations of the EU. Yes. So it's not the end of the world, but the EU always encourages and prefers that each member state generates its own renewable energy in its country yes. first. Yes. Now, there is also the new, uh, uh, what we call, uh, climate and energy plan that each member state has to do for the period 2020 to 2030. In the case of Malta, uh, the scenario was that we can achieve up to 13% renewable energy by 2030. Yes. However, the EU feedback on the draft plan was that this is not sufficiently ambitious and they expect Malta to achieve 20% by 2030. So that will be a big challenge to double our yes. renewable energy by in 10 years. I think it is possible, but it is a bit too ambitious. It is possible if we don't only look at renewable energy generation, but we also look very carefully on our energy consumption. Mm -hmm. If we manage to include energy efficiency measures, aggressive energy efficiency measures, then the energy consumption in Malta will drop and without investing too much in renewable energy, the percentage of renewable energy will rise yes. because the total is now less. Yes. I think it is possible. Malta has done a lot on the supply side of energy. That means on the generation of electricity. We have a new power station, we have removed heavy fuel oil and we are only using natural gas yes. to generate electricity very efficient. We have put an underwater cable between Malta and Sicily. Uh, but we have focused a lot on the energy supply. We didn't do much on the energy demand side, on the citizen side. Yes. How am I using my energy at home? More, yes. How can I save more? How can I improve my buildings? Yes to make them more efficient and then I reduce my energy consumption. We have to work harder there. And if we do, I think there is a big potential to achieve even more than 20%. People, customers, they can choose which kind of electricity they buy, if it is a renewable energy or not. At the moment, no, because we only have one distributor 
in Malta, which is called Enamalta PLC. Uh, and therefore, the distribution is all in their hands. What happens is if you produce renewable energy, then you can sell this energy to Enamalta. They give you the preferential rate, which we call feed in tariff. So you can recover your capital investment faster. And then uh, you, you can also use that renewable energy to improve your energy performance certificate of the place where you are staying or where you are working. Enamalta takes that electricity, mixes it with the, with the fossil fuel electricity coming from natural gas and sells it to everybody according to the demand. Why does Enamalta do this? Because Enamalta, as the main distributor of energy, is obliged by EU regulations to have a certain percentage of its sales coming from renewable energy. So Enamalta has only two options, either to invest in big projects itself, or encourage people to invest, mm. buy this green electricity, and make it, yes. make it its own, so it can achieve the targets of the EU. Yes. So that's how it works in a small island. Of course, in the EU, in other bigger countries, you can, you can choose your electricity. You can, this month, you can buy electricity from one company, which has energy from wind energy, yes. electricity from wind, and another year, you can choose to buy from photovoltaics or from wave energy or hydro or energy from waste and so on. Do you think Malta can be independent uh, from, uh, from energy from other countries? Yeah. When we look at the island of Malta yes. and we compare it, for example, to the Greek islands, there is no comparison. Yes. Because we have a very high population density. We are very uh, energy intensive society. That means the people living in Malta, they make their living not from agriculture or from uh, breeding animals, but from uh, economies that consume a lot of energy. Computers, laptops. We are a, a society based on services rather than on uh, uh, natural resources. So our energy intensity, how much energy we consume per capita, per person, it's very high. And of course, it will not be possible to make Malta a zero energy or zero carbon dioxide emitting island. If we were bigger, maybe yes, but I can't see Malta achieving that target uh, in any time for the next 100 years. Can you tell us more about uh, side of work of your company, the certifications for buildings. Yes. Yes, what buildings do you certificate? How many such buildings in Malta? Okay, so the association doesn't certify, yes. but the members of the association are the certifiers. From, uh, from what we know uh, from the official side, at the moment there are 60,000 uh, EPCs, Energy Performance Certificates, registered in Malta. Most of them are registered for houses, residential buildings, because the highest uh, sector where there are a lot of commerce, a lot of changes, is to buy and sell houses or apartments, flats, or to rent. So most of the EPCs are carried out for these apartments. For non-residential buildings, there are only about 3,000 EPCs because the regulation doesn't require every building to have an, a certificate, but only those buildings that are either sold, rented, built as new, or renovated. So in the case of non-residential buildings, like cinemas, hotels, restaurants, shops, hospitals, uh, sports complexes, old people's homes. These are not very common to change hands 
to be sold and, and yeah. bought and so on. So the number of certificates is lower. What we are hoping to happen now is to find a bit of, to analyze these certificates, to come up with what we call uh, the statistical data and to see what is the typical energy performance rating of an apartment or of a penthouse or of a villa because once you know where you stand then you can improve on that and say okay in the next five years i want to reduce this energy consumption by 20 percent and you can analyze the data in such a way to see which energy efficiency measure will give you the best impact is it the insulation of the wall? Now, Malta is a very mild, the climate in Malta is very mild. It's neither too cold nor too hot. So if you only depend on insulation of walls, probably you will not achieve a lot because there isn't much energy to lose yeah. or gain. But we are very sunny. So probably shading is very, very important. You want to stop the sun from entering these buildings and overheating it in summer. Yeah. But the solution is not the same for all types of buildings. Sometimes it could be water heating the problem. For example, if I go to home for the elderly or in a hotel or in a restaurant, probably the most energy intensive is water heating. They need hot water to wash, the plates to provide services to the customers and so on. So if shading is very important for uh, one type of building, maybe water heating is the most important aspect in another type of building. And therefore these studies cannot be done or generalized. It has to be done for each and every type of uh, category of buildings. Eventually, you get what we call cost-optimal study. In Malta, so far, the cost-optimal studies have been made last year for many non-residential buildings. What is a cost-optimal study? It's a balance between how much energy can be reduced and how much it will cost you to reduce that energy. And you get the best of the two. Once you know that point, cost-optimal point, then you can make it a regulation, you can make it a law. If you build a new building, you have to achieve that cost optimal point or better. Yeah. You can no longer build as somebody built 10 years ago. You have to abide by certain uh, regulations, which will be based on scientific evidence studies. Yeah. And this is how not only Malta carries on with this uh, uh, approach, but all of the EU. It is uh, an obligatory regulation that all member states have to follow the same pattern. Create the cost optimal study, upgrade the, the guidelines and, and the documentation of the country of how to build and how to renovate, okay. wait for five years, repeat the exercise, make it more, uh, more energy efficient, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So you work with new buildings, yes? With buildings which are just now in project, or which built in, in the moment, yes? Yes, it will start the buildings that will be in 2021, January 1st, 2021. Yes. They, they need to be nearly zero energy buildings, we call it. That means they have to be very highly efficient and uh, have part or most of the energy consumed coming from renewable energy. However, the EU doesn't fix what does nearly zero mean yeah. is it 50 is it 100 is it 1000 yes. what is the prison? no you can't do that why because it depends on the weather mm -hmm. if if the if a climate is very cold and you can apply one energy efficiency measure that has such a beautiful impact mm -hmm. that your energy consumption becomes zero then your near zero energy level should be 10, 20 kilowatt hours per square meter of that building. I'll give you an example. If we are in Finland, where it is very cold all year round, 
It means that most of the energy consumed in a building is for heating. Yes. So if I manage to insulate the walls and the windows very well, then that large energy consumption will be very, very low. And therefore, the near zero energy rating for Finland should be very low. But when it comes to Malta, if you insulate a lot, because there isn't so much cold outside, you will end up overheating the indoor climate because the heat coming from cooking, the heat coming from the lights, from human beings, will be trapped in the house yes. and you need to make air conditioning yes. for cooling. Yes, because not enough ventilation. Exactly. So you need to keep a balance. And probably in the case of Mediterranean countries like Malta, when we say near zero energy, it will never be something 20 or 30 kilowatt hours per square meter, yeah. because there is a limit of how much energy you need to heat and cool in a building. And heating and cooling is really the major part of energy consumption in any building, yes. except for special, as I mentioned before, uh, water heating in specialized areas like restaurants uh, or people's homes and uh, hospitals. Yes. So it depends. On each country, it will have a near zero energy level, which is different from the oh, other okay. country, depending on the climate. Yes. Yeah. What do you think? People in Malta, they are aware about uh, problems, ecological problems? Yes. The Maltese population are very aware of uh, the climate change, or better, what we call climate chaos. Yes. It's not a change, it's, it's a oh, continuous yes. change. Uh, the, the, the Maltese, by nature, are energy conserving. However, uh, when it comes to take drastic measures in, that could affect their lifestyle, and here I will take you to a completely different area, because here we are talking about transport now, then they are not very happy to change their lifestyle. In an island scenario, people use cars, and cars are considered to be a prestige uh, ownership. So if you have a car, uh, you are free. You can do what you want anytime, and therefore you, you have a certain level of freedom. Yes, you can reach. Yeah, you can reach. You want to feel free. Yes. So if you, if you don't have a car and you want to depend on public transport, you feel tied, and that people in Malta don't like. So although in the area of energy consumption in buildings, we could make a big, big steps in the next few years, when it comes to transport, it is a much bigger challenge because that is where also a lot of energy is consumed uh, to, uh, to burn in our cars. We have eight cars for every 10 inhabitants. That is a lot. And uh, therefore, even though the, the Maltese are aware about energy efficiency, but they are also very hesitant to give up their present lifestyle, especially when it comes to the ownership and use of private cars. Yeah. Uh, it will take time for the new generation to weigh the advantages of having uh, 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 your own uh, uh, transport means or using collective means like public transport and uh, uh, buses and uh, bicycles and so on, but it will take a generation. It, 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 ten years have to pass yeah. for the new people to start thinking about it. The electric cars are becoming slightly more popular, but their price is still very expensive yeah. and prohibitive for many people. Yes. And government support? Yes, Definitely. Support. Government has a, a very strong support scheme for electric, electric cars, up to 7,000 euros, yes. uh, but it's still not sufficient when it comes to shifting from petrol cars to, to, to electric cars. When uh, on Malta will be forbidden to sell not electric cars? There is this on the agenda of government 
um, they didn't define the year, my guess will be like in 10 years time, they will stop and they will shift to 100% electric cars. But one has to be careful because how will you charge these electric cars? If you are going to charge them from only the power station, then there will be a problem of what we call electric surge. That means at one particular moment in time, let's say between 7 p.m. and midnight, all the cars will be yes. charging at the same time and the power station will not have enough electricity to provide for all these cars. Yeah. So it is not an easy uh, problem and uh, one has to be careful how to promote these electric cars and how to charge them. In my opinion, yeah. there must be a mandatory minimum level of charging points that are actually uh, supplied, powered by photovoltaics yeah. at least. And then also there is the opportunity to move to hydrogen, especially for public transport buses. If they can be powered by hydrogen, then we are offsetting quite a bit of uh, our energy consumption and also our dependency on only electricity. So there are options, but it will take a uh, heavy and serious uh, technical study to make sure that we do not end up with a, a bottleneck of uh, electricity uh, scarcity or high prices of electricity because now you are depending only on electricity. There are not a lot of climate denies now. Not a lot of people deny climate change. Yes. And uh, now we can hear that scientists say for us that we have basically like 10 years till that point when we already cannot stop climate change and it will be like quite fatal for us. What do, you, what do you think, how you see this problem and are you optimistic? Do, do you think that people can change it, can stop, produce so much carbon and to stop climate change? Yeah. Climate change is, has been caused because of the Industrial Revolution. Yes. So this has happened all of a sudden over the past hundred years or so. Now, to reverse this, it will take many more years. I believe that nature has its own ways of healing itself. How? We don't know. But when it lo you look on the overall picture, we can immediately understand that there is a challenge, there is an issue with climate and with the overproduction of carbon dioxide and all the other uh, effluents uh, and, and pollution in the air. So it's not only about temperature rise, it's also about a change in, uh, uh, in uh, climate behavior in terms of torrential rains or the certification or so it's not only on, on, on temperature rise. Also it is on uh, extinction of species, some of which are very important for human life, like the bees who pollinate the trees and so on. So it is a much bigger issue than just temperature rise. Will human beings be able to adapt? That's the first question. Will human beings have resilience? That's another question. So resilience, adaptation, and then hopefully curing of the problem. But before curing the problem, we have to think before whether we will adapt to climate change, otherwise we die because we cannot adapt, and whether we are resilient, whether we have solu temporary solutions that will protect us from climate change. And of course, this is not something that one country can do because the effect is collective. And uh, when it comes to actions that we have seen uh, uh, around us, uh, even from young people, uh, I think I am hopeful because the young people have the ability to change minds and to act in such a way that uh, quick action 
is accelerated even more, uh, favoring uh, the, the mitigation of climate change. And when it comes from the young people, I am optimistic that yes, we will not, uh, we will not have to wait for the next 10 years to reach the point of no return. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it will uh, take a bit of time just for the heads of governments to adapt and to uh, realign their policies to bring the climate mitigation uh, as one of the priorities of their policies. That is the issue. Is climate change mitigation the priority of the European member state governments or just of the European Union, just of the Commission in Europe? So here we are talking about even changing the mentality of politicians. And with the pressure from young generation and the general public in as a whole, uh, they will have to change. They will have to, 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 to make better policies. Yeah. Can you tell us something about waste on Malta? Okay, so by doing so, you have now achieved the, the, the most important three items. Yeah. Energy, transport and waste. Yeah. If we can attack, if we can talk, and if we can make action to, to, to support energy, transport and waste management, then we will be able probably to solve the problem of uh, climate change. Yes. In terms of waste in Malta, we are an urban country, so there is a lot of waste. Waste from tourists, we have achieved now the level of 2 million tourists a year, which is four times the population of Malta, yes. so that's a lot of, of, of people. And that waste is now creating a, an issue for us because there is no place to, uh, to, 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 to get rid of that waste. A number of uh, measures have been implemented. Many of them are successful, but they can be better. They can be made better. And one of them was separation of waste at source. Was now, it successful or not? Yes. And, uh, this has been only going on for a few months. And I think within those few months, the percentage of people choosing to, to separate their waste has increased a lot. And it became, uh, uh, it became part of people's tradition, people's lives to separate waste. So we have the biodegradable waste on its own. Then we have uh, paper, metal, and glass and plastic on their own. And so now the treatment of waste is, is manageable, is better than ever before. What we need to understand is how will this waste help us to generate renewable energy? Yeah. At the moment, there are in Malta two, what we call engineered landfills, which are being uh, uh, replenished, put, uh, filled up with yes. uh, waste. Once these are closed down, then one can extract uh, methane gases from them. You can burn that gas and you can produce electricity. Yes. And that will be also one source of renewable energy uh, for Malta. We talk a lot about electricity because in islands, we do not have uh, other resources. And most of the energy consumed in islands is basically electricity. We don't have gas, we don't have coal, we don't have biofuels, we don't have trees. So we really depend a lot on electricity. And when we talk about renewable energy, we talk about basically how to produce renewable electricity. So we talk about photovoltaics, energy from waste, and to some extent, solar water heating. Even though solar water heating in Malta has not been so successful. If you ask me why it is not so successful, uh, there are many reasons. I believe that the first reason is that there isn't a meter that measures how much savings you make by using hot water that is heated by the sun. Yes. Thermal meters are, do not come as part of the package of a solar heater. And so people install a solar heater, but they don't know how much they save. But if you install photovoltaics, 
you have the electricity meter and you know, ah, today I, cons I produced five units, tomorrow 10. Yes. So people are encouraged. Another reason why people do not believe a lot in solar water heaters in Malta is because uh, in the past, uh, we are talking about 10 years ago, there were certain products on the market that did not uh, operate properly because the water in Malta, most of it comes from desalination. Yeah. And at that time, the salts in the water were above the normal average, with the result that it deteriorates the solar heater. Nowadays, the level of salts in the water has dropped tremendously, and it is within the EU limits on nitrates, chlorides, and so on. Uh, and therefore, the solar heater industry and, and market has suffered from this uh, uh, bad uh, experience. Hopefully within the next uh, few years, solar heaters will start picking up uh, again, especially because government has given now, uh, has doubled the grant on solar water heaters and every family can have up to 700 euros uh, grant for every solar he heater installed in their place. So I, I can see, yeah, I can see that from 2018 to 2019, the number of solar water heaters that benefited from the grants has doubled yes. in one year. So if that trend continues for the next five years, we will have an exponential growth of solar water heaters again. And it is the the most efficient and the most and the wisest renewable energy source. Why? Because it is the only economically feasible renewable energy storage system. You can store the hot water yes. and use it at other times. But if you look at photovoltaics or energy from waste, you cannot store the energy. You, if the sun is shining, you produce the energy and you need to see what to do with it. Yes. If you put a battery, then the price becomes very expensive yeah. and not feasible. So the only way is either you consume it or you send it to the grid. You cannot really store it. Yes. But hot water you can store and you can save a lot and you can reduce the peak load of the power station, especially when everybody wants to take a shower at the same time. Because in an island, uh, it seems in islands, Everybody has the same tradition. Yeah. Everybody comes back from home, uh, from work at the same time. Everybody takes the shower most more or less yeah. the same time. Everybody goes out on Saturday and so on. So there is, it affects a lot how electricity generation and the, 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 the profile of energy production is in, in such a yeah. small place. Can you say how big percent is uh, separated? and recycling, and how big the percentage goes to landfill? Yes, the landfill is roughly, uh, I, I don't have the official figures, but it's roughly uh, 50%. Yeah. Yeah, so a few years back it was 100%, today it's 50%. Yes. So there is the hope that this uh, will reduce even further, but out of that 50%, you could say 90% of it is actually inert waste. Waste that is coming from the building industry. Stones, cement. So the issue now is what do we do with this inert waste? We can either fill the quarries in Malta again with this waste. And then what will happen? So the only option seems to make land reclamation. That means put the inner waste in the sea and make new islands or make Malta bigger. But it's not a project or? No, it's just the idea. It's just an idea. The environmentalists, the NGOs are against it yes. because we have certain uh, Natura 2000 sites around Malta yes. uh, and so on. So the other option is to make use of the inert waste. We are informed that, that then at the University of Malta, 
there is a very good research where the waste from limestone is being converted back into building blocks. And that means that you will have no waste because all the material, material will be reused. So this is another option how you can make use of, of the waste and you can export these stones because limestone is very precious. You can carve it, you can make shapes in it. It is easily cut, it is beautiful in color. You can make different designs and so on. So, and it's not very common in many countries. So we can use our waste, form it into stones and produce it, export it. So that's another option. Thank you, Charles. Thank you so much. I appreciate your, uh, your, your initiative and your stamina to do something like that and to make your uh, part, uh, your contribution to society and to help us also uh, as an association feel that there are people who care. Thank you so much. Thank you.